<laughs> okay, hi everyone, how are you? Good to see you. Actually, I actually don't think I need this because I've got headset, right? Awesome, cool. Technology, awesome, turning that off. Leaving this on up here because I forgot my watch and I don't want to run over. Um, how many of you in this room are students? Cool. How many of you in this room are students and have a side hustle? Okay. And how many of you in this room are not students but are local entrepreneurs, people in the business community, came here to learn today? Cool. Awesome. Any group I left out? Teachers, faculty. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Yep. Always like to know, you know, who I'm talking to and all that good stuff. Um, so, yes, I'm Titania Jordan. Um, I'm the CPO of Bark. Bark keeps children safer online. Um, you all are the first generation that grew up having Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Snapchat um, in a way that nobody else in the history of the world did. And that's really cool, but it's also really scary for reasons you know. Cyberbullying, sexting, thoughts of suicide and depression. Um, it's real, it's prevalent, it's happening. And when you become a parent, you're like, oh my gosh, I just gave my kid this device and they can access the internet and that opens a whole new world of things that, that can happen in their lives. And so at Bark, we use machine learning algorithms to help keep children safer online, but also not infringe on privacy, right? Because I was a teenager once and at that time I had a diary, uh, didn't want my parents reading it, if I even put stuff in there, which I started to not at one point. Um, and we want your privacy to be respected. And um, so we do that by only serving up problems. When there's a problem, we will let parents know via text or email. We don't just give them unfettered access to all of your messages because I just feel like there's something dynamically off about that uh, and it causes friction. So that's a little bit about what we do at Bark. So CPO, what does that mean? Well, sometimes I use it as chief parent officer. Other times I use it as chief product officer. It's interchangeable. Um, as chief parent officer, I'm in charge of making sure that the product is the best it can be for the parents using it. Do I know how to code? No. I, I don't know a lick of code. I wish I did. I wish when I was your age, I took uh, computer science courses and learned Java and Ruby and HTML and CSS and all of those things. If I could go back in time, I would absolutely do that. Good news is, is that despite not being able to do certain things in life, you still can do all the things if you put your mind to it and say yes. So anyway, now you kind of have a frame of reference for who I am and what I do. But why I'm here to talk to you today, um, gosh, there's so many things I want to say. I actually wrote them all down in this kind of, can you see? This is a little bit all over the place, but I'm going to just go through them and mark them off as I go. So who am I? Talked about that. Um, <laughs> authenticity. That's a big thing. No matter who you are, where you are, what you do, if you can be real with people, they will gravitate towards you. Um, so much of the early part of my life was spent wanting to make sure people liked me. They thought I was cool. I had on the right clothes. My breath smelled nice. My hair looked good. Like all of those things are important. But when people get to know the real you, they know what you struggle with. They know what your fears are. They can connect with you. It's disarming. And they start to realize, hey, I'm not alone. Like other people in the world are going through the same things. And you actually can get a lot further together if you are much more real with each other. Also, the good news is about getting older is you start to care less about what people think of you, and it is so liberating. Like, oh my gosh, I wish I could go back to my 16-year-old self, like, when I'm on a beach in a bikini, like, oh, I'm so fat. It's like, no, you look great. Like, 30 pounds up, 30 pounds down, you look great, because you're 16. You will never be 16 again. When you're 80, you're going to wish you looked like that. So, you know what I mean? Just, just own the skin you're in and, and own who you are, because each person in this room is a unique gift to this planet. Nobody is alike, and I know we all know the like, okay, yeah, our fingerprints are different and our DNA and yada, 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 but like each one of you has a very, very special gift and purpose on this planet, and like it's so exciting to know that one day you will be living that to the fullest if you're not already. So kind of embrace that and go with that. So that was the authenticity note. 
Um, next, saying yes and saying no. So a lot of the opportunities that I've had in my life, and trust me, they have been completely nuts, right? I've been a CMO, a CPO, um, I've owned a marketing agency, I've been on the Today Show, I've been a Good Morning America. All of these things happened because I said yes, even when I wasn't sure if I could do it. <laughs> it was really, really scary, um, but I kind of live life with like, why not, right? If not me, then it's gonna be someone else and I wanna do it, so I'm gonna try it. Um, alternatively, saying no more often. The, the flip side to saying yes too much can become uh, over committing and under delivering as you just heard Patrick speak about. That's, that's a big thing that I struggle with even to this day. I wanna help all the people, I wanna do all the things. And as a result, I say yes, 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 yes. And then I start to not be able to respond to emails as quickly and not be able to deliver what I said I deliver. And your reputation is everything. And so um, it's very empowering to be able to say no. Say no more often and it frees you up to say yes to the things that matter. Um, so that's saying yes and saying no. Going back to the saying yes thing, I live by the four C's formula. There's this book called The Four C's Formula by Dan Sullivan. He's a motivational speaker, this crazy influential dude. His story is amazing, you have to Google him. And it's the four C's. It's commitment, courage, capability, and confidence. And I was kind of living that without knowing that I was until I read his book. So the first thing is make a commitment. Um, the producer of Atlanta Tech Edge, you know, the local NBC affiliate for this market, 11 Alive, they, we have a show, Atlanta Tech Edge airs every Sunday. And um, they asked me to try out to be the host. And I was like, oh my gosh, I had never taken a class in broadcast journalism. I didn't know how to read a teleprompter, but I was like, this is awesome. I am definitely gonna try out. So I made a commitment. I was terrified, I was shaking, I was so, so nervous. But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna kick myself if I don't try this. So I made a commitment. It took a lot of courage. Um, sometimes medicine <laughs> can help with that if you, you know, are having panic attacks and anxiety. I have been through that process and you know, there are things that can help with that. So commitment, courage. And then through the process of committing and having the courage to do it, you actually develop the capability. I was so rocky in the beginning if you don't do this, but <laughs> if you were to go back and like Google some of the first episodes, you can tell I'm like, you know, I'm a newbie. I'm just cutting my teeth on this world. Um, but over and over you start to learn and, and refine and get better and better. And towards the end, um, as uh, it got to the end before I resigned, um, I think I was pretty good, you know? I'm not gonna like brag or anything, but I was definitely a heck of a lot better than I was when I started 13 months before that. Then confidence, right? Now I have the confidence. I'm just waiting for the phone to ring. You know, maybe Katie Couric needs a backup one day or you know, Savannah Guthrie's like, I just can't make it to work. I will take that call and I will fill in for you. I now have the confidence. And so no matter what you're doing in life, it doesn't just have to be in the entertainment field. If you repeat those four C's, you will continue to evolve and get better and better and better. And the improvement is exponential. It's not, it's not just minimal, it's exponential. Um, and so that's, that's a great thing. All right, marking that off the list. Um, it's a small world. Y'all, it is so small, especially in Atlanta. Atlanta is the biggest small town ever. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have been so thankful that I have held my tongue or not burned a bridge with somebody uh, that could have easily done so because I had been faced with them uh, in the future. Um, you know, I've walked into investor meetings where I've pitched you know, funding from 200 to 500,000 to a million dollars. And somebody sitting around that table with somebody that I've known from my college days or even elementary school days. Um, it's pretty crazy how, how worlds intersect and um, just always be nice to everybody. You never know what, what battle they may be going through. Um, attitude is everything. Try to keep a positive one no matter what. Um, be as nice and as friendly to the janitor as a, in a place as you would the CEO because that janitor one day could become the CEO. I actually have a friend whose dad owned the uh, perimeter Ford dealership started as the janitor, uh, Mr. Carr, um, and ended up owning the dealership and becoming very wealthy and very successful because it, it actually does happen. Um, so that's, that's the, it's a small world and attitude is everything. I um, also want to talk about eye contact. Um, 
you know, a, a lot of times people say, how are you? How's it going? And you know they don't really mean it. They don't care. They're just kind of, you know, just making conversation, killing time. When you ask that question, really mean it and take the time to listen and see how people are doing because um, it might not keep you on schedule. It might not achieve the objective you were there to achieve that day, but you will, again, form a relationship with somebody that can end up being lifelong, and you might be the person that they needed to talk to today. So don't ask that question unless you really want to know the answer. Um, let's see. Have, has anybody in this room read the book Cheaper by the Dozen? Nice. Okay. So I remember reading that book when I was 12, and it's about a family. They have a lot of kids, but the dad's job is an efficiency expert. And I was like, what? There's actually jobs that allow you and pay you to go in and tell companies how to be better and how to do better. And after I read that, I think I was like 12, I was like, I want to do that. I have a lot of opinions, <laughs> and of course, I think they're great, and I want to tell people how to do things better and how to stand out. And it's funny because in this world that we're living in, you know, like back in the day when I was a kid, there were, there were three channels. And then there were like 12 channels. And then cable came along and there were a lot more. And then there was the internet. So it's like you take a, a glass globe and shatter it and all those pieces of glass are the fragments now with which you have to get people's attention. And that's not just a TV screen, it's a mobile device, it's an iPad, it, it, it's everywhere. Everybody is competing for everyone's attention all the time. I mean, shoot, there's, there's screens at the gas station now, y'all. Like everywhere you look, people are competing for your attention. So it's so important to figure out how to stand out. One of the reasons I focus on branding, design, copywriting is because you have to constantly be going to the next level to figure out how to capture somebody's attention because there's such, such a fight for it. So no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you're doing, always be cognizant of how you're talking to people and how you can do it differently. Um, you know, Patrick also mentioned before me about being creative. Um, I didn't really know when I was a kid why it was so important that I played with Legos and I, you know, organized my colored pencils in rainbow pattern and, you know, built my Barbie houses, but it allowed me to really explore and be creative. And creativity is so, so important in everything you do, whether you're a B2B, B2C, you're a doctor, you're a designer, it's so, so important in how you talk to people. So that was standing out in fragmented market. Um, I want to talk now about revisionist history. You read about Instagram and their success, or Yik Yak and their success. You read about all these people that had major successes, and then you start a startup, and you're like, oh, man, like we're three months in, and nothing's happening. Six months in, nothing's happening. Y'all, if you go back and read, it took these people sometimes years, sometimes 10 years to get it right. So it's funny, when you do hit your success and Forbes asks you to tell the story of your company, you'll be able to write that revisionist history and say, oh, well, A, B, and C happened and now we're here. But just know that in those months and years and weeks and days, um, you know, startups can put you in the highest of the highs, but the lowest of the lows. And those lows are very real and very pervasive, but know that you will get back up to a high and you can fight through it and you can get through it. So that is revisionist history. Um, I want to talk now about depression uh, and imposter syndrome. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting or faced with an interview and I have just been frozen thinking like, oh my gosh, if they really could see inside my head right now and know what my abilities aren't, like they'd ask me to leave. Like, I, why am I here? Why am I here on the stage right now? You know, it's like, what? Um, then I read the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. And knowing that she was head of what she was head of at, at Google and head of what she was head of at Facebook, and she still suffered from imposter syndrome, I was like, girlfriend, no, that's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. So knowing that everybody that you encounter at some point struggles with feeling like they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, they're not fast enough, they're not innovative enough, helps you to realize like, you know what, I'm okay. I'm gonna have good days, I'm gonna have bad days, but I'm gonna be okay. Um, case in point, touching on the depression thing. Um, I used to be a, an account executive at Star 94. Um, it was great, it was fun, you know, Usher would come in and, uh, 
um, Jennifer Lopez, and like it was just the cool, fun, hot-fitting thing, right? Um, and then the economy tanked, and nobody wanted to buy airtime. And I was like, well, I think I'm going to start a family now. So um, I had my son Jackson, and I uh, had postpartum depression. You you can't really anticipate it. It can just come out of nowhere. And I didn't really understand what it was while I had it. But for basically the first five months of his life, I was just in a fog of kind of hopelessness and anxiety. I was always afraid, like, something's going to happen to him. I'm going to drop him. What's this, you know, chemical my neighbor is spraying on their yard? Is it going to give them cancer? Like, it was crazy town. It was very, very awful. And on top of that, I went from, like, this awesome, uh, fast-paced, fun, pop starry world to, like, literally being at home, breastfeeding in sweatpants surrounded by diapers. Like, what? Is that? I mean, that alone is kind of depressing. And I would watch people um, living their best lives on Facebook and Instagram, their success, and they're speaking here, and they're on this show, and they're launching this company, and they're having these meetings and launching these cool lifestyle brands. And I was like, oh, what is my life? Like, what do I have to offer? Who's going to hire me? What am I going to do? And I was really kind of in a hole. Um, if you were to tell me back in March of 2009 that I would be here on a stage talking to all of you about entrepreneurship and innovation and leadership, I would have been like Will Ferrell in old school, like, you're crazy. <laughs> I love you, but you're crazy. But it can happen. Like, it really can happen. Um, I personally subscribe to the belief that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, I know that there's probably a lot of varied uh, beliefs or lack of belief uh, in anything uh, in this audience, so this isn't the, the platform for me to, you know, preach to you today. But personally, if you do want to know what gets me through, uh, through life is, is that right there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today's show calls and needs me to go talk about keeping children safe online. I can do it. Not because of me. I'm a human. I make mistakes. I have issues. But I have a higher power that, that I truly, truly, firmly believe in and keeps me going every day. It's why I have eternal hope that anything can happen. Um, and I wake up every day with that hope, knowing that if there are problems to solve, why not me? Why not me? And why not any of you? Um, I want to go now and talk about unique gifts and problem solving versus problem dwelling. Um, I think one of the things that really hinders people is that they just dwell on a problem. They get paralyzed by it. Um, but if you can shift that thinking to, you know what, I might not have the answer, but I'm going to solve it. I'm going to become a problem solver. I'm going to use my unique ability, and I'm going to solve this problem, and I'm going to come out on the other side better for it, and hopefully other people will too. Some of the craziest inventions that have made people the most money um, have just been from solving problems. So what sort of problems do you see in the world that you can solve today? You know what I mean? Like you could be making major, major bucks within the next year if you figure that out. Um, I think finally, before questions, um, I want to talk about simplifying. Um, on that note, when you set out to solve a problem, um, it can get very complicated. So many companies that I've helped launch, uh, both in the Atlanta market and across the U.S., have had these great, great big plans and great big explanations. When I say, okay, so what do you do? They launch into this, you know, novel of what they do and how they do it and who they do it for, and we're multi-channel cross-platform for this and blah, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've just gone cross-eyed. Like, what do you do? If you can let people know what you do in the most clear and simple way, it will resonate leaps and bounds. I mean, think about Apple, the master of branding, right? You go there, it's beautiful, it's simple, a two-year-old can operate it, like they're winning. So, and whatever you do and whatever you put out there, if you can make it as simple as possible, you'll be winning. How many of you in this room use Canva for graphic design or... So you know those little uh, quotes they give you? Um, one of my favorite ones is, you know, it's so easy to make something complicated, but it's very hard to make it simple. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I subscribe to whenever I'm developing, helping to develop a tech product. I want to make sure it's 
easy for my 95-year-old grandmother to use. If she can use it, and she is on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> if she can use it, we're winning. Um, so yeah, that was basically a, an ADD deep dive into my brain <laughs> and what I wanted to say to you today. And um, just want to open it up for questions. You can literally ask me anything. This is like a Reddit AMA. Ask me anything, go. Yes. <laughs> Great question. So how close is my actual life to my plans when I left college? Oh, y'all. Um, when I left college, let's just say I was doing things that were not uh, college-sanctioned activities. I was definitely, you know, drinking, smoking, all that kind of stuff. I was so lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was really, really down because I just felt so unempowered. I was dwelling on my problems instead of solving them. So um, somebody came along and was like, hey, you should intern at Star 94. And I was like, great, that sounds good. I had no idea that this trajectory in, um, in technology and, and public speaking would even be a thing for me. That was terrifying to me at the time. Um, also, you know, my whole life I was kind of raised in the church and with a strong faith and that sort of thing. But in my college years, I kind of stepped away because, again, I was depressed. I just kind of felt lost and aimless. And um, as I kind of came back and said, you know, God, I'm sorry. I've been, I've been an idiot. Um, he forgave me and uh, kind of helped me get back on track. Questions, all of them, just bring them on. Yes. No. How do Yes, so good question. So how in the world does somebody like me, uh, you know, run a company based on AI and machine learning when I can't write a lick of code? Um, yes, you raise money and you hire good people and you hire smart people. So we raised money and we hired a data scientist from Microsoft. Um, and when you, when you run a startup, you really have to dig into, are you going to pay somebody what they're worth or are you going to pay them less than they're worth but give them equity? And that's kind of a personal decision that each founder and employee will have to make. But there's a combination of the two going on there. Um, yeah, so developers, engineers, data scientists that are truly, fully, solely devoted to solving that problem. Yes. So Bark right now, we have 10 employees. We just hired our 10th employee. Uh, he starts tomorrow. And he's um, solely focused on customer acquisition and our paid customer acquisition efforts. So it used to be that you could just create something really awesome, like a great ad and drop it in the world and it would be received and you'd get tons of customers, it'd be great. But now there's Facebook ads and Google Analytics and you know, you've gotta be so, so laser focused on lowering your cost of acquisition and quantitative data. And so that's what that he will be doing. But yes, 10, 10 people and we're all remote. Um, we've got three people in Atlanta and the rest of the team is spread out all over the globe. Yes. Ooh, managing people on a remote basis, biggest tip. Um, you have to hire people who are self-motivated, right? Um, if they're, you know, inactive on Slack all day and posting cat pictures on Instagram, you know, probably not a good hire. But if they get stuff done when they say they're going to get it done and they do it well, then there's really no problems. Um, we touch base daily via Google Hangouts or now Slack has video integration. Um, so yeah, we're always, we're always talking to each other, um, yet there are people on the team that I've never actually met in person, yet I feel very, very close to them and have, have worked very well with them. Yeah, I mean, we use Basecamp, um, you know, to keep everybody on track and, and for accountability, um, but really everybody 
that we hire is a get it done before it's due kind of person. And, and like Patrick said, under promise over deliver instead of vice versa. Yes. Yes. Wow. Um, three years from now, uh, I have two paths. I have a technology path and a media path. So on the technology front, I want to have either scaled Bark to a place where we're a household name and we have integrated with companies like LifeLock, McAfee, Cox Communications. We're bundled with internet service providers and mobile carriers, and we are truly making an impact in keeping children safer online. From a media standpoint, I want to be a, a regular technology contributor for the Today Show or Good Morning America or CBS This Morning. So we'll see. <laughs> Other questions? Literally anything. Yes. Yes, great question. I, I get a lot of people coming to me with their ideas and they want to start companies. Um, I would say a few things. You have to validate your proof of concept, right? Like there's a lot of things that you can start and do that would solve problems, but will they make money? Will they make an impact? Will they be profitable? So I would say don't spend too much money on the perfect uh, prototype. Um, I would say launch a minimum viable product, whether that's a tech product or an actual thing you can touch and feel, um, and, and test, and test, and test, and test, constantly test, get feedback, know that you are not your user. If you do not listen to your users and get feedback from them, um, that's one of the worst decisions you can make. Um, so you have to test, and get 100 loyal fans. If you can get 100 people that rally around your product, help you iterate on it, and are really using it, and it is improving their lives, and you can make uh, you know, a profit off of it, then if those 100 people uh, it all just tell one person and refer them, then you've doubled your user base. And then that's how it grows. So, so perfecting the product as much as possible, validating your concept, and then showing that you, hockey stick growth. So what investors want to see is that you've put something out in the world and so many people are, it's resonating with so many people that your growth is exponential. And where investors come in is when it's, you know, it's here, it's here, and then boom. If they're on the upward trajectory, they want to get in there because their returns will net them a 10x return as you start to spike. Sometimes you can sell on a, you know, a hope and a dream and a wish and a prayer. It's happened before. Um, it's very stressful, you know. I don't necessarily recommend that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, a lot of vetting. Um, so, you know, when you put out a job description on AngelList, for example, you know, we, we, we put out that description for our, our customer acquisition marketing hire and got about 200 applications. So, um, you know, it's really going through and reading what they wrote, but also reading between the lines, uh, multiple phone calls, meeting in person, um, you know, also, I have to give a huge shout out to 3CI. They are a, a tech talent staffing company. Um, and full disclosure, they sponsor my YouTube show. Um, but I would recommend them even if they didn't, because I've known them since high school. Really good people. And um, they can kind of take that heavy lifting off of you by helping to marry the right sort of person and their talents with what you need uh, in your company. Yes, that's, that's a great question. I struggle with that very often because I'm a firm believer that if you're going to really succeed at something, you've got to be hyper-focused. Um, luckily, where I am right now in my role in a tech company also affords me the ability to pursue the media career as well. So 
but I'm very, very sensitive to it. If at any time one is pulling me away so much from the other that I'm not giving my, my full to it, I've got to really reevaluate which path do I want to go on. And, and to be perfectly honest, I'm going to need to decide pretty soon uh, which one I'm going to go on full blown, full blast, because it's hard to have so many balls in the air. And honestly, even more honestly, a year ago today, I had like 10 balls in the air. It was, it was too much. I couldn't do it all. I was this and this and this and this and this, and I was, I was doing a lot of things, but I wasn't doing them all well. And so that made me feel really crappy, you know? I just felt like a failure in all of them. So, you know, I had to learn the hard way to start saying no. Um, so if somebody had asked me, who are you? What do you do? Well, I'm an entrepreneur um, who I think is great at talking to people and connecting with people and, and telling the story of a person or business. So, yes. The least fun part of my job is accounting and reconciliation. Oh my gosh, just, you know, because it's, it's one thing to just send an invoice, but because I'm so OCD, I'm like, what if I forgot about a receipt? And, and what if there's this email? I, you know, like I want to make sure it's, it's buttoned up. So I, I stress about not having all of the elements I need to make it perfectly 100%, you know, just, yeah, accounting. Well, <laughs> good news is that <laughs> I don't get paid <laughs> unless I do the accounting. So if I want to pay my bills and eat and do fun things, I, I just... But, you know, no sugarcoating here. I wait till the last minute. I definitely wait till the last minute. I put it off. I don't recommend that. Do not follow my lead on that. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. You know, it's crazy as we're growing up young women you know, I grew up in the 80s when I could be an astronaut and I could do this and that, you know, so, you know, I'm poured into to do as best, as good as I can in school and I can be anything I want to be. But what they don't tell you is that if you're going to have children and you're going to have them biologically, like, it's not the easiest thing to do that in conjunction with your career goals, right? Like, physically, there is a toll. It puts you at a disadvantage against men. You are tired. You literally, you know, towards the end, can't walk very well. You cannot tie your shoes. You cannot run if somebody is chasing you. Like, you are physically impaired. Um, and then, you know, there's all the, the hormonal things that happen, too. Like, you know, for the first two weeks after Jackson was born, I was just crying all the time. Like, you can't go out and close deals when you're crying all the time and you're, you're just, you know, everything is just not where it needs to be and your clothes don't fit, like... You know what I mean? It's rough. Like, guys, you, you're really lucky that you don't have to have babies. I'm just going to put it out there. I'm a little bit jealous of you. Um, so, so, yeah, I think talking about it, right? Like, there's a lot more things I could say that make everybody in the room super uncomfortable. I'm not going to do that. You're welcome. But having those open and honest conversations with your male colleagues about the struggles you're going through will help them to realize, like, wow, it's really not that easy. And, you know, I grew up in the South where... I was taught, like, I need to always have my nails painted and wear a dress and heels and make sure there's a hot meal at the table for my husband and y'all, like, for real. And, and that's not my life right now. My husband and I share all the duties. I'm lucky to have a husband, right? Like, I'm not a single mom. God bless you if you are. Um, my husband helps with the cooking and everything. But at the end of the day, I still struggle with that mom guilt. You know, I'm not there. I'm not there for that first pitch. I'm not there for that recital because I'm in... Silicon Valley trying to close a half a million dollar deal, right? You know, long term, will that pay for my child's college and will he thank me? He better. But, if it, you know, but in the meantime, I feel awful. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of rambling, but just having those conversations and fighting, like, you know, maternity leave sucks in America. It is not cool. It is not cool at all. Um, and so working with employers that, that can understand and support you in that journey, both men and women, great. You know, my husband went back to work two days after I had Jackson. I had just brought a human into the world through my body and my was gone, you know? That was really freaking scary because I had to keep this human alive, like 
all by myself. You know, it's really scary. Um, and so if he could have had better paternity leave benefits, maybe I would have held it together a little better. Um, also, if I didn't have to choose between being with my child or being at work, that would have been great. If I could have brought my son with me to work, you know, he slept half the time anyway. You know, it's like bringing a puppy to work. People would have, you know, morale would have been improved. Um, and, and you know, you know, again, this is, sorry if it's TMI, but like if you choose to breastfeed, you have to pump, right? So then you feel like a milk cow. You know, I was in this this prize closet at Star 94 with a bunch of tchotchkes, you know, cups and banners and stuff, and I'm just, just, just this machine, you know, for like every three hours, and I couldn't be out closing deals and making calls and schmoozing people and working my way up the ladder because I'm literally in a closet like a milk cow, like not cool. So really just pouring into to women in all facets and knowing that you cannot have it all at once, but you can have it all in different areas uh, and just making sure you have work-life balance is, is huge. So thank you for asking that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so a um, couple things. You know, today's a good day for me. Today I'm like, yay, all the things, I'm going to do all the things, and I'm winning, and this is great. Um, a week ago, I was all like, oh, you know, kicking the can down the street, like, oh, what is my life, you know? So, I mean, knowing that when you're in those holes, um, just don't stay there. Know that it, know that you you won't stay there. Um, I, I do a lot of things to get out of those holes because those holes are very scary to me. Um, very dark thoughts happen in those holes. So listen to music. I, I paint. I watercolor. I dance. I go for a bike ride. I, Y'all, I bought roller skates, like not roller blades, but the old school roller skates with pink wheels from Amazon the other week. So I'm like, I'm going to get out and skate on the belt line. You know, just doing anything I can to like get outside of that hole. Um, on a personal note, I noticed that whenever I drink alcohol, the next day and sometimes up for a few days after that, I just feel like crap. It does not work for me. So like while I want to go out and have fun and schmooze and drink and stuff, I realize that that's really just not the best thing for me. So I try to abstain from it as much as possible because I really try to stay in a good mental space. Um, and, and reading and talking to other people, um, you know, you think your life is kind of sucky, but then you you talk to other people and they're going through things that are way worse than you, like, hello, everybody in the Virgin Islands right now. You know, life's not so bad. You know, when our power was out for two days last week, not that big of a deal. Like, the people down there won't have power for six months. So pouring in other people and, and getting some perspective can really help when you're, you're down. Yes. Long-term goals. Um, either sell Bark for a ridiculous amount of money to a company that will keep everybody's best interest in mind or scale it from a revenue standpoint uh, to where we're just killing it. Um, the way I stay focused on that is by, you know, in a startup, you can get pulled in so many different directions, but what are our core KPIs? That's key performance indicators. What are the core metrics that we need to hit to achieve those and then really, really just focusing on those. What can we change about product or messaging or partnerships or biz dev that will help us on that path? And pretty soon, six months from now, we'll look back and be like, wow, we've really accomplished a lot. Like our user base has doubled in the past month, which is it's so exciting, right? Because you start to see the fruits of your labor. Um, on the media path, I need to get over my fear of pitching these producers at these large media outlets. You know, I'm always like, oh, I've got a really good idea for a story, but oh, it's probably dumb and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to send it. But like, no, send it to Tanya. I need to just send it, you know? The worst they can do is not respond or like write back and be like, that was a terrible idea. But they're not going to do that. So I need to keep, you know, putting myself out there. All right. Cool, so my email address, and full disclosure, I'm so bad at responding to email, but like I will get back eventually. Uh, but I would love to hear from you. Um, uh, my email address is just my first name and my last name at gmail.com. So please feel free to hit me up, Instagram, Twitter, all the places. And um, thank you for listening and for your time today. <laughs>